He's Howard Eibach, a former copywriter and creative director and the author of two books on the creative brief. And he's Henry Gomez, an ad agency strategist with over 20, is it 27 years now, Henry? Almost 28. Almost 28 years of experience. Together, we are the Brief Brothers. We love talking about advertising, creative briefs, and briefing. And today we have a special announcement. This is our 150th episode. On top of that, we are entering our fourth year together as the Brief Brothers. And we've got a great topic today. And thanks to our buddy, Cameron Day, we have met a guy named Ben Levy. He runs a company called sellitgreat.com. He is an expert when it comes to helping creatives and agencies sell their work to their clients. Let's have part one of a two-part conversation. All right, Ben Levy, welcome to the Brief Brothers. Henry and I are grateful to have you on our show. Grateful to be here. We are blessed today. Ben is a an expert in presentations, creative presentations, and he'll tell us more about that. I wanted to do a quick shout out to our friend and a former guest, Cameron Day, who called me just a couple of days ago from Austin. He said, Howard, you need to get reach out to Ben Levy. He has a, a great business that he's doing. And it just happens that while Henry and I have talked here and there about the value and the importance of presenting the work that comes from a brief, we really, it's, it's a gap that we need to fill in our repertoire of topic discussions. So we're grateful that you could, could uh, join us. And guess what? You are joining us on our 150th episode. Oh Woo-hoo! man, you yeah. should have, this, this is all right. Well, it's, it's only going to go up from here. This, the, yeah. So this is this is <laughs> was, uh, was Craig Hahn our, busy? Yeah, Henry and I are entering our fourth year together. Sometime later this month, I think, is the actual anniversary. We're just going to say January of 2024. We started in 21, so this is actually beginning of the fourth year. We wrapped up three full years. So this is kind of like a big deal. A big deal here. The 150th episode, a topic we haven't really discussed. Our fourth year together. I, I don't know if I can stand all the excitement. So anyway, <laughs> welcome, Ben. Tell us a little bit about how you, what drew you into advertising uh, and how does your trajectory in your career lead you to what you're doing now? And I believe the name of your business is? Sell It Great. Sell It Great. Sell It Great.com. Yep. So we'll include a link to your to your business. So give us a little bit of background. So I am fairly unique among creatives in that I actually went to school for this. I feel like most creatives fall into this business. I decided early on, I was lucky enough to have some some graphic design and marketing type classes in high school. And when I discovered that I would not be an aerospace engineer because that involves math and also some experience flying, and I'm very much 4F. I, I went, okay, let's let's try this advertising thing. So I went to Syracuse University. The, the renowned Pete Berry, who wrote the advertising concept book, was one of my professors. Mm. I, I left there and wound up at Miami Ad School in the Miami location. So I, I had some great foundations beat into me by the, the folks at, at Crispin and, and in Miami who were doing some great work there. And that was my, my start was I had had been given every opportunity to to learn from the greats that were around me. And I tried to take in it, as much of it as I could. And I started working right out of ad school at an agency that's no longer around that was called I Chameleon Group. It was phenomenal. And at the time it was, you know, this is this is late aughts and everything is is digital right i was working on flash landing pages but i was doing those for clients like coca-cola and guinness Mm. and so i i didn't even appreciate when i was an intern and a junior how lucky i was looking back to to get to cut your teeth on work and campaigns that even if if we weren't coming up with the core campaign to work on happiness factory that widen was was producing wow. at the time and yeah. get to work on a piece of that was so instructive and and so amazing and in some ways that was where i learned the value of presenting one of the things that was unique about i chameleon group is that at the time they pitched using scamps 
which was the European style. So you didn't comp what, anything. What is this? What is a scamp? A scamp instead of a comp, where you've you've mocked up what the work will be. A scamp is a sketch of it. Huh. So everybody on staff were, was actually it's a group of ex graffiti artists, and it's kind of like a throwback because it used to be like the cocktail napkin, right? That's right. And then and then we started doing comps of ads. And eventually those comps became digital comps of ads. Yeah, yeah. And yep. basically what they were seeing was a finished ad. And and uh, and we may get into this, but I think that that has created a deterioration in the thought processes of clients because they're focusing on little details rather than the concept. You know, oh, I don't like the hair color of this model. And it's the model that we got from stock photo. It's for position only. And they're not looking at what the concept is. Yeah, they're trying Absolutely. to correct. They're trying to correct the Greek copy. Like, come on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, but, but that's a thing that we see. And so, what's funny is, again, at the time, I didn't realize the significance, but you were forced to have a conversation with the client that was much more strategic, that was much more conceptual, because they knew, obviously, the details are going to get hashed out later. The, in a, in a the finished step. work is going to be polished and it's going to be, and we'll have a lot of time to scrutinize all those details. But right, right now, what we want you to buy is the, the idea. Right. That's right. And this is something that I come back to constantly with my clients is that the point of every meeting is just to get to the next one. One of the things that, that we often fall into these days and clients are, are complicit in making this happen we try to do everything in a single meeting because nobody has time. Like the timeline is only four days to begin with. So one of the things that, that happens is come in, show us the brief, show us the research, give us the, the concepts, we'll pick one, let's talk about what the budget can support, let's get going. Well, that creates a, a series of cascading approvals in a single meeting. Right? For that to work, You've shown me the brief. It's been two minutes. It's the first time I've seen it. I'm going, well, okay, yeah, maybe. Then you're going to talk about the research. Are you sure? Okay, I guess so. I wasn't really set on the brief thing, though. Oh, now we're into the concept. Okay, one, two, three. I got to pick one of these. Well, and the you, you know, Ben, on the one of the things. End, yeah, one of the up. things I've learned. One of the things I've learned in the, you know, over the years of being in, in the in the business, and what I talk about in my brief writing, which I think is going to connect to you and your and your helping others with their presentations, is that. Deadlines are bullshit. They're just pure <laughs> yeah. bullshit. Yeah. And and the the line that I come back to over and over and over again, I've written essays in my blog about this, is a line that I love to use. It's you probably heard this before, and Henry's heard me say this before. There's never time to do it right. There's always time to do it over. So that that's just right. that's just evidence and proof and, together. And I'd argue the... I'd argue also that in today's day and age deadlines are more bullshit than ever. Like it's one yeah. thing if you had a, the close of a magazine or a newspaper and you had to get right. it in. The under, file, you had physical files in. Yes. And, right. and you had to FedEx the files and, and, or the, or the, the beta max, the beta cam SP tapes to, <laughs> to the TV station for right. air. You know, when you have yeah. street, you can start a campaign whenever you want. You could start yeah. a campaign today in 10 days and 15 yeah. days. We're not, you're not waiting on the January issue of Life magazine when the close date is for receiving the advertising for the layout. So, but the mentality hasn't changed. There's still this look around, look, run around looking busy. Don't get me that it's a whole other topic, but like <laughs> client timing is, is the worst. Like you could go 10 months. And the clients don't do anything. And we start approaching the end of the year and the holiday season. And they realize oh. now that they have three major initiatives that they need to take care of when everybody's taking vacation on your team and you're planning on taking vacation. And the agency is closed right. for a week between Christmas and New Year. And it's like, come on, man. So, so Ben, let's use this as advertising. an advertising. You know, I, if you're, if you're, I want you to finish your trajectory of your career to how you got there, but I think maybe the, no, one of the ways you can, myself. okay, well, it. one of the, one of the questions I'm going to ask you, cause I, I use this kind of as a fourth, as a, a door opener or an, uh, uh, an icebreaker for me, is I say, there are three or four or five common mistakes that brief writers make that I want to promise that we're going to cover. We'll, we'll address them in the workshop. So do you, do you have a similar kind of list? Are there a, a small or a consistent items that creative presenters 
usually flub or do incorrectly or do poorly that you like to talk about to help get the conversation started about how you can help them become better presenters? I've I've got a couple. Yeah. One of the big ones is that we we seem to fear questions hmm. in a presentation in a pitch. If you think about the way that the deck is created, if you think about the kinds of conversations that happen in the hallways before you you go and present that work to the client, everyone is saying, but I'm worried they won't understand it. But I'm worried that they they will have a question about this. Well, well, what if that's confusing to them? And this is how our decks get bigger and bigger and bigger. And this is how the appendix gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's also how we walk into the room and treat it like a commencement speech as opposed to a conversation. Mm -hmm. So that's one big one is that we have a habit and everybody says the same thing. I want this to be a conversation. So please feel free to interrupt me at any time. But while you do it, keep in mind that I'm going to keep talking like this. So I'm not going to give you any time to actually interrupt me. And in no way, shape or form, is there any opportunity for you to do so? But at the end of the presentation, I'm going to be finished and say, <clears throat> any questions? You know, it's funny. I, I was uh, just I just listened to a few weeks ago the the uh, biography, the Walter Isaacson biography of Steve Jobs. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that Howard and I lament is everybody always talks about Nike and Apple, um, you know, as if, you know, Cheetos is going to be Nike or Apple or, you know, like or the brands that, you know, gain detergent is going to be Nike or, you know, right. it's it's ridiculous. But right. if if we put if we put uh, Apple up there as one of the top, you know, advertisers and one of the most innovative creative advertisers, certainly of the second half of the 20th century, um, it's hard to see and based on what I, I read or heard in the biography that Steve Jobs was being presented to in a rapid fire staccato by an agency. He was having a conversation with Lee Clow in which they explored different things. And it was that easy uh, going kind of friendship, like a friendly relationship where neither side was intimidated by the other, where big ideas could be explored together. So I think that that's yeah. a, a good point is set the tone as conversational, right? We're equals. We're all invested in this. We all think of ourselves as semi-creative at least. Let's right. talk about these. It's fun. This should be fun. It's, you know, it's not me, the door-to-door -door salesman telling you how these handy dandy fuller brushes are going to solve every problem in your life. So it's interesting that you mentioned the door-to-door -door salesman because one of the things that I often point out is, and this this goes into that list as well, that when you're speaking to marketers, to advertising agencies, to creatives of all stripes, you're talking to people whose literal expertise is to make strangers they will never meet part with their money for goods or services. We all know a whole lot of rules, written and unwritten, to help us do this. And yet, when you walk into the room where there's a client that you know, brand new, that you know, right, that you've had a relationship with them for years in some cases, you leave all of that expertise behind you. Think of all the things that we say about work that you could never say about a deck. If we're talking about a piece of video content in a hundred years, I would never let that thing go without analyzing the first frame. Is this grabbing our audience's attention? Does it have a hook to it? Where does it feel slow? Can we can we cut those parts out so that it's sped up? And then we walk into a presentation and what do we do? <laughs> we we recap for 25 minutes. Yeah. Or, or, we show, or we show an idea that has 59 seconds of beautiful message and then there's a second of sales. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 no, we'll, and if we'll it's a branding, that. if it's if it's a branding campaign, that's what it's supposed to do. But it also assumes that we're we're gonna it assumes that we're gonna pay attention for the first 59 seconds. But in terms of the creative yeah. presentation, we load it with a bunch of filler right. and boring stuff and meandering stuff instead of capturing their attention, making them get riveted to it. And then at the end, if they're like mesmerized, then let them have the ask the questions, you know. Um right. And, and we but, fear the questions, right? Everybody, yeah. uh, let me let me just get through this and we'll talk about questions at the end. 
Yeah. No, not at all. No, I that's first not of all, how it works. Yeah. I'm just I'm begging for signs of life, especially if it's a, a virtual presentation. My gold star these days is can I get someone to turn their camera on without asking them to? Mm -hmm. Can I create a conversational enough atmosphere that that name gets replaced by a face because they feel like I need to be here and talk to him? That's to me. That's the 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 highest honor I can get these days. And it happens. Let's go back. Let's go back to your history because I'm I'm like still like I hanging on. So you started I Chameleon. I <laughs> so think I started I started at I Chameleon, which was a, a small shop, and and I. And you realize what they, they had a, a unique way of presenting that they didn't have at other places you went to subsequently. Yeah, that they they were the only ones who did scamps. Everybody else, it was it was the era of comps, and you got to see the difference just in the the kind of conversations you were having with clients. Where by its nature, it had to be more conversational, give and take, because you were showing cocktail napkins if you had scamps, and when it became comps people were taking away things from what was supposed to be just an example, a placeholder that you didn't intend for them to take away. And to this day, I'll tell people to be incredibly careful with the, the swipe that they use or the comp that they'll put on a slide because to you, it means something. But I've seen people put a picture of a peacock up because they want to talk about the array of colors. Well, the client sees that and the first thing they see is a peacock. Mm -hmm. they don't see colors if you go and this is about the colors they're oh okay but they think you're selling them a bird so these are the kinds of things that i noticed being different as i moved from i chameleon group to places that were doing more of the the standard and to your point like a peacock is a is a bird that has a it has a loaded you know when somebody's peacocking they're showing off they're right. being braggadocious right. so it it literally is many multiple ways that you could interpret this and and wonder, you know, oh, you know, am I is what I think I'm communicating actually what the other person is receiving? Well, as a, as an educator, I, I, we all we are all educators. As a as a former college instructor with a, you know, five ounces of pedagogy to my credit, um, one of the things I've come across that social scientists talk about all the time is something called curse of knowledge, which yes. means you you will be in danger as an instructor if you assume that others know what you know. But we yep. fall into the trap all the time. We we fall in this trap all the time. If I walk into a classroom and I'm going to teach a student, you know, remedial grammar, and I assume that they know what a verb is because I know what a verb is, I'm I'm just I'm probably going to waste the next hour because they don't know. They might know how a verb works, but they don't know what a verb is and they couldn't pick one out on a you know. If it came up and hit him. So you have to remember Absolutely. that that they're not thinking what you're thinking. So I, I actually right. used to teach a workshop at for the ANA on how to evaluate creative, which is a different version of what you're doing. It's it's after you've presented the work. Now I'm the receiver of the work. Well, how do I what do I say? How do I do it? And one yep. of the things that I used to say was. Don't make a decision in that room. The people presenting to you have been with it for days or weeks, depending on how, depending on how much time you gave them, right? Yeah. It's like yeah. over the Christmas break, maybe you gave them three days, but they've been living and breathing with this for a period of time. And you, the receiver of this information have not other than, you know, the product. So don't be forced to make a decision right then and there. Sometimes you have to, sometimes the circumstances require you to make a decision, but if you have the luxury of saying, let me think about this, let me absorb this, and I'll get back to you tomorrow or the next day. Now, creatives absolutely hate that. Yeah, I want to know. You're, you're, making, you're making my skin crawl. But right. this, this, <laughs> but could, be, a... this could be a two part episode, I could tell already. because <laughs> <Well, laughs> but... But, but there's a piece of that that I very much agree with and, and that I caution everybody about all the time. Another one of those things that, that people frequently, that creatives frequently make a mistake on is that they talk about how the work gets made before they talk about what it is. And it's yeah. part of that curse of knowledge you talked about. Yeah. The thing that I love about the curse of knowledge is that the smarter you are, the more likely it is that you're suffering from it. Yeah. Because you you just assume that everybody else has a baseline knowledge that's up here when yeah. nobody does. Yep. And the 
the mistake that happens is for us as creatives, whether it happened three hours ago or three weeks ago, the concept, the idea that came first. And then we had to prove to ourselves we could do it. And again, maybe we only spent two hours proving that because we were bang up against the meeting. Maybe we've spent a couple of weeks, but that's the next step. You have to go talk to production and you have to check out the tech and you have to talk to media and just, just make sure that yes, you can pull this thing off. And so what happens is, because that's where we've spent all of our time, we forget the client doesn't know about any of this. And we walk in there and we'll go, we have the greatest thing ever for you. Are you ready? The clients, yeah, okay, show me the thing. And We're going to do a right. stop motion animation of the yep. blah, blah, blah in 3D. And we're going to use this technique and this whatever. And here's the commercial. <laughs> Instead of here's the idea and yeah. how we're going to deliver it is. Or even, even before that. Stuff. Even before they say, we came across this amazing piece of information. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even use the word insight because that just gets too, you know, inside baseball. It's like, yeah. we discovered a, we discovered something about the way our customer thinks about apples or whatever. And that led us to this thinking. And all of a sudden we had this gem of an idea and it became this blah, blah, blah. I wouldn't even, you know, that's, that's how I would begin. But now I'm, you know, I'm not in the business anymore. I don't, I don't practice. But, but, I, <laughs> but, but I think yeah, it's I mean, a, it's a symptom, right? Like a lot of creatives are enamored with the process. Right. Yes. And yes. which is another related to don't assume the client knows what you, everything, you know, it's also don't assume that they have the same motivations as right. you do. Right. So that, like yes. I, you We're see that in, that in foreign policy all the time. Like the biggest mistake you make is assuming that your adversary is a rational uh, actor who has the same motivations that you do. And no, he's a totalitarian or he's a, you know, he's a theocrat. Like that. Yeah. You, you have to put yourself, you have to put yourself in, in their mindset to understand what they're trying to get out of the negotiation or the interaction or the warfare or whatever it is. And so here it's the same thing. Because you're an art director that's fascinated with the stop motion animation doesn't mean the client is. Right. And that's so, not the way to sell them. No. And so that that takes me to another piece. And I know I still haven't told you how I've gotten into this. We'll get there before the end. But that <laughs> takes me into another piece that I wanted to, to talk about, which is something that I refer to as the invisible brief. And the, the reason that I, I came up with this construct is because, same as I was talking about before, we have all of these skills in, in persuasion when it comes to advertising. We don't use them when we present advertising. Mm -hmm. So I like to tell people that the pitch is advertising for the ads you want to make, right? It's an ad for your ads. And if that is true, it should also have its own brief. That meeting should have its own guidelines for what your goals are and what your audience is looking to achieve. Because the other piece of this and why I think the invisible brief is so needed is there has never been a brief that I have heard of or seen that asked you to get the CMO of a company to buy more of their own product. So the people we're making work for, those consumers, that work is for them. And then we walk into a completely different room and say, look, this would be perfect for teenage girls. But you're saying that to somebody who's an elderly white male with two vacation homes and a medium-sized yacht. Well, yeah. even um, a, a middle-aged white woman who has two uh, homes and a yacht. Well, I mean, it well, I hope, well, she well, should you're be making just as much money. Yeah. But, well, <laughs> you're, what you're basically saying is that the creative presentation to the client is a separate creative product yeah. that requires its own brief. Know, yes. your, know your audience. Know exactly. your audience. And exactly. So the, an anecdote that I, I can give, and it actually worked out really well. And I've told the story here on the podcast. You know, um, I work at a Hispanic agency. We have big blue collar, blue chip clients, not blue collar, blue chip clients. Ford Motor Company, a lot of blue collar workers. Um, but um, we have blue chip clients. Hard from the Hispanic standpoint, as big agency of record for big institutional clients, to win a lion at can. So we came up with an idea for Burger King, which was racking up lions at can. And I wrote a brief um, because I knew I could get a meeting. And what ended up being the most useful part of the brief 
was actually that I found an interview with the CMO and which he talked all about, like how he evaluates ideas, what he's looking for and whatever. And that ended up being actually that invisible brief. Right. So yes. they kind of completely disregarded what I had written in the brief about like, uh, you know, what I thought would be an interesting creative avenue, which was fine because this was a spec assignment. Um, yeah. But they really took to heart, like the, our presentation ended up being really good because we knew what his expectations and his criteria were. And that's exactly it. That's exactly it. So when I talk to people about the invisible brief, what I say is that, you know, as humans, we're motivated by three things. It's money, power, fame. Mm -hmm. And sometimes somebody will say, well, but my client really wants KPIs. You know, they want those results. They want the data in order yeah. to support the acquisition of money, power, or fame. Yeah. And well, you know, they, do you know who Bob Hoffman money, is, Ben? Yeah. Yes. You know, what he, he said every brief should be three words. Every brief right. should be three words. Make me or make us famous. Famous. Yeah. And if if every client had the kind of relation, every, every client had the kind of relationship with its senior creative that Steve Jobs had with Lee Clow, that would be a lot easier to accomplish. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. But not everybody does or ever will. It's so, true. And, and that's, so there's another piece of that as well, where sometimes I'll say, these are the motivations, money, power, fame. You can add to that sometimes, what are people's values? And this, this again, speaks to, to what Henry was talking about of, are they motivated? Is their values, are they held in the company that they're part of, All right? Steve Jobs, if, if you opened a vein, it would bleed Apple. Right. And, and, and I say, it's very easy to find people who are like this because they always wear the, the, the branded fleece with the logo on the chest, right? They wear it to every meeting, they wear it to productions there, you know, that person loves the company. So you can speak to them almost as you would speak to somebody internally about the brand, about the culture, about the history. They value these things the way that, that an agency person might. You also get people who are, whose values lie not with the company necessarily, but with the people consuming their product or service. So I was lucky enough to work with somebody one time who had just joined New Balance. Previously, for 15 years, they'd worked at Nike. And one day in a meeting, they shared the reason they left Nike after 15 years is because Nike told them, we're never going to spend as much money on running shoes anymore as we spend on, on basketball and skate shoes, because the return is way higher over there. Mm -hmm. And this guy was a lifelong runner. And he said, if, if you're not going to put that focus on the craft, I'm going to go to the company that does. And at the time, that was New Balance. Well, that guy cares about the customer. So right. everything that we spoke to him about was the impact this would have on people. That what the well, product it's, it's we interesting do that launch. it's interesting because you said money, power, fame, and I went to a new biz seminar once, and the guy said there's only three reasons to take a client, and it's one, it'll make you rich, or two, it'll make you famous, or three, it'll make you happy. And it, you know, every if a client isn't doing any of those, you shouldn't have the client. And you'd be very lucky if you get two out of three with any particular client, three out of three is unheard of, right? So yeah, you might yeah. work with a nonprofit because it makes you happy, but it's not going to make you rich or right. it might make, you might be working with them because they can help you get famous, um, et cetera. But it sounds like this guy wanted to be happy and happy for him was working with a brand that acknowledged his passion, which was running um, and new balance was, was, more of that but i think there's also a third client right so there's the client that bleeds for the company a client that bleeds for the for the for the customers and there's a client that kind of is in it for selfish motives right like yes. he's just trying to get to the next level he wants to you know you want to make him famous within his little thing and understanding these psychologies is important like yeah. it is like Absolutely. you're going to be famous in your organization. That's not going to work for the guy who bleeds for the organization already. Right. That's right. And, so, and there so, are some people who their, their value is just, this is my job. I punch in and punch out. Yeah. So, and that's fair. And the reason it's important to know is you can't come in there and say, I'm going to make you CEO because they're not going to respond to that. You've got to meet them where they are. So ask, be open to questions right? Know who you're talking to. It's not necessarily the target audience of the brief. It's the target audience of the company that you're pitching to. That's right. And what's next? So you'll have, you'll have what's their motivation? What's their values? 
and then remember that that piece of it that whatever whoever you are speaking to is not your audience so there's going to be a communication gap between who the work is for and who you're telling about it and you have to bridge that for them mm -hmm. i see this all the time when people talk about bleeding edge tech or they talk about influencers right? influencers are a massive problem when you go to sell them to a client because nine times out of ten the client doesn't know who they are they don't understand why they should matter in their industry. Who, who is this stranger? Why should I spend all this money on them? How do I know they're going to make something useful? And numbers are not going to make them feel comfortable because we have nothing to compare them to. So that's the other piece to think about is, is that curse of knowledge creeping in again. If you've identified who's on the other end of this, who your audience is when you're talking about creative work, where's what's the gap that you have to help them bridge? Where, where along your trajectory uh, in your career path did you sort of begin to see that this as was an opportunity for you to uh, to switch? And, and what was what was your role before you became the pre presentation guru? Were you a copywriter, uh, creative director, art director? I was, a, I was a creative director, and I came up through the the copy side. Okay. So I around the time I was a senior writer was when I started to realize that was when I started to get into some meetings, and I started to realize that having great ideas was not enough. Mm. At that time in my career, I I was lucky enough, I had started to make some work that you know, things were hanging on the wall in the agency, people would walk by, oh my God, that's awesome. I'm so excited for you. We're gonna get to make this thing. And then the ECD would come back and be like, sorry, dead on arrival. And I, I couldn't handle that. Mm. <laughs> There's something about me. It was like, well, did you did you do everything you could? What'd you say? What'd they say? What happened next? And if you're if you're a Hamilton fan at all, it was basically me singing, I want to be in the room where it happens. Mm. And yeah. that inspired me to, it, while I wasn't comfortable there at all, there was nothing I wanted to do less than be in the room talking to the client, except having to sit on my hands and wait for someone to come back and tell me that it didn't work. Mm. So I started pushing to get in the room. And I was god awful. I was one of the worst people you could ever have to present. I actively diminished and minimized my role in the meeting. I thought that I was just there to advance the deck and the client would do all the, the thinking and the talking. And if the idea was right, they were going to be the ones to tell me that's what it meant to have the good idea. I was so bad, in fact, that my boss at the time would say, you can be a little more excited about the work. And I thought he meant talk louder. So I shouted into the speakerphone for the next six months. <laughs> it, it had no discernible effect. I expect on the other end, they were just turning me down. You know, right, like yeah, I had right. no idea what I was doing. But it was killing me that these ideas weren't getting through. And so I started looking around. I read everything I could. I was lucky enough over the next couple of years to work with some people who truly embodied the conversational aspect of presenting. I went back and thought about how things were different at different agencies. And I turned myself into a guinea pig. It was a lot of trial and error. There's a lot of great stuff left on the floor that haunts me to this day because I was trying things that didn't work. And if it did work, it took me six times to prove that it did because just because it works for one person in one setting doesn't mean it's going to work every time. And when I was done with all of that, I was a, a pretty good presenter. And that was about five or six years. And at that point, I was an ACD. And I started getting put into the room at every opportunity. Because this is something that isn't taught in agencies. You have to pick it up through osmosis. You're, you've got 100 other things to worry about and the deadline. And unless it keeps you up at night like it did me, you're not going to go out and put your focus into all of of those things and pull out what's beneficial, what's valuable from the information that's out there. So yeah, well, I'm going to give it, uh, just quickly, Henry and I have talked about this. Nothing is taught in ad agencies anymore. Nope. Not, not just not presentation. Nothing is. No, there's no mentorship. There's no, and, and, and I should add that throughout most of my career, I was teaching at Miami ad school or I was running internship programs. The mentorship is something that I enjoyed. So learning and being able to pass on those learnings was a, a virtuous cycle for me. And I had some some reward from it. But 
the fact that I was putting in so much effort was pretty unique into, yeah. into to pulling these so, things out. So, so as you were talking and explaining like your, your uphill climb to become a better presenter, you know, two things occurred to me. One is that some people are naturally good, right? Like some people have a personality that's engaging and they kind of just instantly get it. And other people are smart, but have to work realize oh there's something wrong that i have to work on and i i kind of call that's like the pete rose effect or pat riley they're not necessarily the best physical players but they realize they're not the best physical players so they start to really analyze well what works what doesn't work get every inside edge and those are the guys that become the dominant head coaches michael jordan isn't a head coach because he can't coach what he had he had a natural god-given ability that was coached into him as well like there's no doubt that he worked hard it wasn't that he didn't work hard but he can't say okay do this do that do this stick out your tongue and then slam it from 15 feet away that right you know pete rose was charlie hustle nickname that he earned derisively i think mickey mantle gave him the nickname in spring training because uh, in spring training, everybody takes it half ass, and he was running out everything. And, and Mickey Mantle said, "Hey, who's Charlie Hustle over there?" When he was a rookie. Yeah, but you're so, right. I think uh, I think that there are. It, it's I, I agree with that completely in terms of what I have seen with presenters and the, the sort of people that that will walk into the room in an agency and try to share the work. You have some people who have a natural personality, and that gets them pretty far. But what I've what I've found since specializing in this is that they have massive blind spots and it's not their fault. Again, nothing is taught. So you take these people who have had a degree of success within the world of, of pitching and presenting, and they're going to do the things that they think are working for them. And in some scenarios they will, and in others they won't. And they'll walk away thinking, Oh, you know, you don't win every time, but in fact, there was something else they could have done there that was just a massive blind spot because experience is a terrible teacher. The stakes are good for motivating you, but the lessons come out of order. They're spaced way too far apart. And sometimes you don't know what's a lesson and what isn't. So it's, I I can see it on both ends. You'll get the people who really have to sit and, and analyze and figure it out. And oftentimes they don't come into their own until later. And then even then it's a question of, who were they watching because they could have picked up some bad habits. And you also get those people who had some natural gift. And in some cases, their curse is greater because they'll never move beyond that point compared to the people around them. They feel as though they have an advantage. And for me, it became a situation of, well, when you're in the room, we win. So you've got to be in the room every time. And the last time that, that I heard this, it was from the agency owner and I was brought on specifically to build up a copy department. I was still doing a lot of the writing myself as well. They were growing as an agency and I I had a hand in that. There was too much. I couldn't be in the room every single time. And they said, well, we have Fortune 5 clients. We can't put these people in there. We don't trust them. And I said, okay, I hear you. But again, I've taught for a couple of years. Let me create a program, like a 12 week program. And let me grab four employees and let me teach them everything that I think lets me do what I do. It's about scalability, right? You can't grow unless you have people that you can entrust to do important tasks. Absolutely. And an interesting piece of that, when I first got into this, I thought the majority of my clients are going to be agencies at the end of their rope who are in trouble and they haven't won a pitch in God knows how many months. And in fact, it's been the exact opposite. Most of my clients are on a hot streak. The problem is now they're overwhelmed. Their bench was only so big. And now that they've got three new clients, they don't have anybody to walk into those rooms and sell. They have people they can trust to make the creative, but they can't trust them to sell in the creative. So I get a lot of business from agencies that find themselves in that position of we can't grow unless we scale these skills that up until yesterday weren't a priority. 
So when did you decide to pull the trigger and go out on your own? So that first cohort that I taught did really well. And looking back on it, of course, I got lucky. They were people that I worked with all the time in the agency. So I knew exactly what they needed to hear. And I could always help them along and get the point of the lesson. And I got to pick them. But it worked out so well for them that the syllabus I'd written escaped the building. Somebody showed it to a spouse, who showed it to a coworker, and I started getting phone calls. Is this the thing mm -hmm. you do? Can you come do this for us? And the mentorship was a thing that I loved. At the time, my kids were, I want to say four and six, maybe they were five and seven, maybe they were four and six. And I was very aware of the demands on my time as a CD and as a department lead. And so I said, you know what? Let me see if I can make this work. I love doing this. It's a skill that I wish I had, you know, an opportunity that I wish I had coming up through the industry. And it'll give me a chance to get more time with my families. If nothing else, if this whole thing fails, I will have spent some time with my kids. The <laughs> irony, of course, is that I go to, to start this three months before COVID hits, and I got more time with my kids than I ever want again. And <laughs> starting a business when the world shuts down is not generally advised. But that was, was my moment to pivot, was to realize that for me, it was such a transformational thing to go from the, the person who wanted to be anywhere else other than in that room, to go from the person who felt like the fate of my work was reliant on other people who went away mm -hmm. and then came back and said, sorry, man, not this time. Let's get back okay, to work. Okay, so so you're, you're you're out on your own and you're starting to get some calls and you're doing some work. What's the biggest surprise that you encountered, say, in your first year of doing this? The biggest surprise I encountered was actually the fact that there were a lot of habits in the ad world that I had to unlearn. So I have been promoting myself purely organically on LinkedIn. And I figured if, I, if I'm actually any good at this, if I'm a writer and a creative director, I ought to be able to, to make content that can take off and live beyond me. Kind of like George, uh, what's our friend's name? George, George Tannenbaum. George yeah. Tannenbaum. A great self-promoter. Yeah, phenomenal. And I, I had to relearn some habits around creating social. And I've, I've led social accounts for two national agencies. I, I, at one point was, was two national brands. At one point I was running a team that was putting out 180 plus pieces of unique social content a month. I can do social in my sleep, but the habit we have in an agency, which you can support with a team of making everything perfect does not fly when you're a one-man operation. Mm -hmm. So in that first year, I know Photoshop well enough to, to get around. I'm completely confident in my writing skills. I can make a site and I'm doing all this stuff myself and I'm exhausted. And I remember even when I put the site up the first time, I treated it like a regular launch. You know, I had some grind. I was like, I want to get it done this week. I got to put the time in, let's do it. And I woke up the next morning and the site was still there staring at me in the face. And in an agency, you do these projects, there's these massive launches, and then you're on to something new. And, and you have at least a little, you know, 48 hours before you have to come back and look at that thing again as you hear how it did. And I was so shocked by the fact that like nothing had had changed in my universe. Here I was still sitting with this thing that I'd been grinding on for weeks and weeks and weeks. Yeah, so which moving, you could have put up a in a half, setting. you could have put up in a half finished state and been working on it and say, yeah. you know what, we're, we're going to just improve this as we go along. That's right. That's yeah, well, that's one, so you know, that's one perfect lesson I've being the yeah. enemy of good. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So that well, was so, that was the biggest one for me. Good stuff, Henry. Good stuff, Howard. He's Henry Gomez. And he's Howard Ibach. And together we're the Brief Brothers. Till next time. Bye-bye.